हरे कृष्ण प्रभु जी धन्यवाद प्रणाम प्रभु जी धन्यवाद प्रणाम वेलकम प्रभु जी ओह जतिन प्रभु वेयर आर यू यस प्रभु जी हियर ओनली आई एम इन शार्लेट डिड यू वेंट टू इंडिया नो नो प्रभु जी इन शार्लेट ओह आई थॉट यू आर इन इंडिया आई डिडंट सी यू मॉर्निंग ऑल्सो आई वाज थिंकिंग वेयर आर यू ओके एवरीथिंग वेल देयर यस प्रभु जी यस हैप्पी टू सी यू बैक प्रभु हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण प्रभु जी धन्यवाद प्रणाम Two more minutes. will begin now Om Agyanti Miran Dasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshul Un Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Swa Padantitam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamanam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shashi Rupam Sadrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Kamsa Jeevam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitam Shri हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधु दीन बंधु जगतपते गोपेश गोपिका कांता राधा कांता नमस्ते तप्त कांचन गौरांगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी विश्वभान सुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वंश कल्प तरुभ्य कृपा सिंधु पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नमः 
जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैता गदाधर श्री वासादी गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे मुखम करोति वाचाल पंगुम लंगाय ते गिरी यद कृपा तम हम वंदे श्री गुरु दीन तारिणम परमानंद माधव श्री चैतन्य ईश्वर नम ओम विष्णु पादाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य शताब्दी जयत सुरतो पंगो ममा मंदा मतिर्गति मत्सर्वस्व पदाबोज राधा मदन मोह दिव्या वृंदारण्य कल्पद्रुमार श्रीमद रत्नागर सिंहासनस्तु श्रीमद राधाशील गोविंद देव श्रेष्ठाली बी सेव्य मानो स्मरा श्रीमन रास रसारंगे वंशी वटाटस्थिता कर्षण वेणु सुनेर गोपि गोपीनाथ श्री अष्टमा तो भक्ति शास्त्री रिव्यू सेशन चैप्टर सेवेंटीन द डिविजन ऑफ फेथ द कनेक्शन बिटवीन सिक्सटीन चैप्टर सेवेंटीन चैप्टर सिक्सटीन चैप्टर वॉज डिवाइन एंड डिमोनियक बेसिकली टू एक्सट्रीम एंड बट दिस पर्टिकुलर चैप्टर इज वट्स इन बिटवीन एंड हाउ लाइक देर इज डिवाइन हु वर्शिप सुप्रीम पर्सनैलिटी ऑफ गॉड हेड there is demoniac who are atheistic but there are many others who have different forms of worship some worship demigods so are they divine or demoniac some worship other living entities some worship ghosts some make their own god by their own whims and not everybody worship supreme personality of god right so they are not fully demoniac they are not fully divine then where are they and that's why this chapter is called division of faith it's not about complete worshiper or complete atheistic but one's worship is also based on the three modes and that's why three divisions basically so break down of this chapter the modes determine one's faith and one's worship begins with arjuna asking krishna what about those who don't worship according to scriptures because scripture specifically propagate worship of swayam bhagwan the supreme personality of god everything every other form of worship is not as per scriptures <clears throat> proper also says bhakti means only for god one cannot have bhakti for demigods the relationship with demigods is more like give and take but bhakti means i offer my heart to you i belong to you i surrender to you that is only with god so first seven verses the most determine determine one's faith and one's worship then um the chapter continues to describe the food in the three modes sacrifice in three modes austerity in three modes charity in three modes and what does om tat sat means and what is the importance of the word om tat sat so first is the modes determine one's faith and one's worship arjuna inquires this is the first verse you see in the bracket one that represents the first verse arjuna inquires about the situation of those who do not follow the scriptures basically does not worship swayam bhagwan but worship nishtha nishtha means with faith in our uh, language by rupa goswami nishtha means like steady or one who are very dedicated to but worship according to their own imaginations um like ghosts or humans or demigods why they are worshiping them not because it is mentioned in scriptures but own imagination own imagination refers to their desire is fulfilled so now they dedicated to them that's what krishna says in bhagavad gita because i only give Uh, fulfill the desires of the demigod worshippers and i do so so the demigod worshipper can develop nishtha in their uh worshipable deity in whom they want to have faith krishna develops that relationship so this is all considered uh 
imagination because it is not based on Shastra strictly. But worship with faith, with determination, with steadiness, according to their own imagination. There are so many people in India, like many housewives dedicated to the Ganesh worship, like very dedicated worship of Ganesh or um, dedicated Shiva worshippers, dedicated all different type of types of uh, personalities. <clears throat> Are they influenced by mode of goodness, passion, ignorance? So Arjuna also has this understanding. So he's not asking what about them, but he's clearly asking, are they influenced by mode of goodness, passion, ignorance? So in a way, he knows the answer. And Krishna also says the same thing. Yes, it is based on one's instinct, one's nature. So in Bhagavan, Sri Krishna says, if one does not follow the Vedas, what does Vedas say? Om Tad Vishnu Yat Paramam Padakam Sada Pasyanti Surayas. Vishnu is the Supreme Personality of Godhead who resides in Vaikuntha. All the demigods as per Vedas, as per scriptures, are presidents of Swarg Lok, which is within this universe. So obviously none of them can go to Vaikuntha planet. Um, one who does not follow the Vedas, one will follow the natural instincts with which, which will be in goodness, passion and or ignorance. Who are under the modes, those who know the injunctions of scriptures but are unable to follow. So Prabhupada, I like this statement very much. Prabhupada says, who are under the modes, those who know the injunctions of scriptures but are unable to follow. In other words, we know what is right, what the scripture says, what the Guru wants. But we are unable to follow their works. And this is because of the influence of the modes, which is uh, which has covered us. When we become free from modes or purified, our life will naturally be walking and talking scriptures. Because all the knowledge is revealed within the heart and one naturally follows the original consciousness of jiva uh, one will naturally follow that but because one is not pure not pure is covered by the modes then one cannot follow the scriptures as they are basis of acquiring modes why we are under the modes because of past activities whatever we do if it is not bhakti it is going to bind us to the modes. Any a moment spent without bhakti is capturing us within the modes. If it's a good activity, we are bound by mode of goodness or passion ignorance. What is the current mode which is prominent in us is based on our past activities and behavior. But Prabhupada says bhakti will bring us to goodness. Anybody sincerely doing sadhana in the morning, very soon they will come to goodness. And that goodness is unlike other goodness because this goodness is mixed with bhakti. The outsider goodness is simply a state of pride that I'm better than others. Um, I see things as they are. I don't have suffering. It's a state of pride. But devotees' goodness, when they come, it's... Uh, um, non-reactive and Krishna in the center. So bhakti, no matter which mode we are in, sincere practice of bhakti will uh, um, but our path, but what we are today is based on our past activities. Our present will decide our future modes. That's why bhakti will save us from going deeper into the entanglement of lower modes. How to change influence of modes? Carefully follow spiritual master. Consider things carefully with intelligence. See, activities are very important. What we do, what we speak, what we desire, how we act. Very important. So when a situation comes, then consider things carefully with intelligence 
based on the words of spiritual master. Oh, this is not good for me. Krishna, please protect me. Or see from the eyes of scriptures of everything in this world. Let me not develop any attachment in this world because uh, it's illusory happiness. It's illusory promises. The influence of the modes. Nature of this world by default is temporary. Everything in this world is temporary. Let me work towards the eternal. My true, my true nature, which is uh, my true state. Let me try to awaken that. So, how to influence the modes? Consider, consider things carefully with intelligence. Carefully follow spiritual master. Then Krishna says, those who are in goodness, they worship demigods or impersonalists. Passion, worship humans. Ignorance, worship ghost. We discussed a little bit in previous chapters also. People in passion come to the earthly planet in ignorance, lower planets, animal species. In goodness, even impersonalists are worshippers of goodness. Even impersonalists are in a lot of goodness. They have their own sadhana. But because they are not worshipping God directly, it's not fully transcendental. That's why it's considered goodness. Then scriptural injunctions. Only the supreme personality is worshipable. Bhagavatam 4.23 Prabhupada says, Satvam Ishuddham Vasudeva Sabdetam Man in pure goodness worships Vasudev. Usually goodness is not pure. Even if we act, even if we act mostly in goodness, there will be desires arising from passion and ignorance. Lower modes never leave us but until we are completely purified. Pure goodness means zero influence of lower modes. Mm. That is transcendental. Then we completely worship Vasudha. What obstruct Trust from worshipping Vasudev is uh, uh, material desires. Because material desires will take us away from the desire for bhakti, desire for Krishna and we want to engage our time in other things. They will constantly pull us. So that is material desires is basically lower modes, passion, ignorance. So, man in pure goodness, he worships Vasudev. Then, uh, verse 5 and 6 define demons. Mm. They undergo severe austerities and penances not recommended in scriptures. Many politicians do that. Then, impelled by lust and attachment. Lust and attachment because... Why they are doing austerity penance is not recommended in scriptures because they want something from that. And that something is lust and attachment. Attachment means, lust means attachment. Material attachment is lust. Because they have a material desire. That's why they are doing austerities and penances. Because they are doing something not recommended in scriptures, they are most likely not doing it to least supreme personality of God. So they're impelled by lust and attachment. They perform them out of pride and egoism. They think, see what I can do. When they are successful, they go out thinking, uh, see, I did it. I made the change. And now they want worship from everyone because they think they are worshipable. And it's all manifestation of false ego. I am the doer. I am the enjoyer. I am the center. Even bhakti can also bring give rise to these things if we are not careful. Bhakti can give rise to pride. Bhakti can give rise to false ego. False ego basically means 
through bhakti i want to be the enjoyer i want to be the center and impelled by lust and attachment um we may use bhakti to fulfill our material desires it's more in subtle form for devotees name and fame which is also lust and attachment it's subtle lust name and fame so then those desires those pride those egoism is not divine what you know tapu says uh, in a commentary to this verse trinada pisani china shiksha ashtakam verse bhakti yana thakur says no that krishna is residing in the heart of all living entities therefore we should offer respect to all living entities under all circumstances um one should not feel that one is better than others because everyone is because krishna is in the heart of all living entities one should keep one's heart simple they are Uh, foolish and they torture the material elements of the body as well as super soul it is said in bhagavad gita that when they torture their bodies with severe austerities not for the right purpose out of material desire that give rise to pride and ego uh, it is very displeasing to the lord that's why they torture the material elements of the body as well as super soul rare fortune for such person to be guided by spiritual master but if they find a bona fide guru who will direct them towards the real path of krishna consciousness then their life becomes directed in a perfect direction and if we see if you go back to our past that's our life pride egoism lust and attachment but then um, what did we do Uh, we were guided by a bona fide spiritual master and now here we are walking on a path of bhakti and trying to make our life successful one can make one can make out the mode of faith by observing the activities of eating sacrifice austerity and charity so based on different modes one's worship will be there um these modes each individual has a particular mode prominent whatever mode one is impelled by one will have a similar eating habits he will do sacrifice charity austerity with that mode in mind he will worship according to that mode so they all will align you can know a person that's why i said one can make out the mode of faith by observing the activities of eating sacrifice austerity and charity in other words uh, you can easily know everything about a person by one activity of him also because if you know the scriptures if you know gita if you know the activities in three modes then you will have um you can see based on one simple activity you can know which mode he is in and once you know which mode he is in you can know for sure any sacrifice any austerity any charity it will be motivated by that mode it's not that we are doing charity in goodness and then austerity in passion and sacrifice in ignorance no or worship in pure goodness no they all will synchronize that's why great spiritual teachers like there is one story of tamal uh, krishna goswami maharaj they opened a temple i am sure devotees have heard this yugal kishor prabhu has spoken many times this story um this they opened a temple and they had mangal aarti and neighbors one neighbor one one man would complain call the cops filed a case with the city um, the city was on their case filed a court case also it was going extreme and extreme and extreme so tamal krishna maharaj was the leader of the temple he came he said i want to meet the neighbor so the neighbor came so tamal krishna maharaj uh, 
saw him the way he speaks what he speaks tamal krishna maharaj understood which mode he is in and then um maharaj asked him so what problems do you have in life so he wrote two three problems and maharaj took the paper and he wrote 20 more problems and maharaj gave him the paper and he says you don't only have these two three problems you have this 25 problems total at least and when he read he could understand all the problems that he had and he was surprised how maharaj knows but it was very easy for maharaj because maharaj in few minutes talk could understand which is a prevalent mode of this personality if that is his mode then all his desires his attachments his problems everything if you know bhagavad gita if you have some control over bhagavad gita control means some understanding and if you remember you can know everything about a person what sacrifice he is doing why he is doing whom what, what is his kind of worship what is he inspired by what kind of charity everything you will know because the modes don't fluctuate they fluctuate but the prominent mode will act it is just like in ayurved also they can know you are kapha vata pitta and based on that they can tell you all your health problems how you behave what are your shortcomings what you are affected by what you are not affected by what is good for you what is not good for you and people when they see these doctors they are surprised how they know everything about my body very simple ayurved shastra speaks about what is the dosha and what are the connected problems with that dosha and how they treat problem is not symptomatic treatment like there is a symptom and then you cure the symptom which they are doing now that also but they mainly try to balance the doshas how we treat that thing in bhakti is try to raise to the modes but there you can balance the doshas by medicine but here you can raise the mode by bhakti one has to chant then the lower modes will go away so that's why this particular section last six chapters called gyan yoga they give us actually very clear understanding of this material world krishna says you can see things as they are everything as they are in and out like you know, the spiritual masters by two minutes talking to you they know everything one is parmatma revelation one is they can understand very nice so one can make out the mode of faith by observing the activities how one eats one can understand whom he would worship they are all interlinked because principle is the mode is one prominent mode so wise those who know and discriminate based on these activities the wise can understand foolish those who consider all kinds of food sacrifice etc to be same and does not do foolish means are in ko he likes this he is eating this he like that he is eating that what is the difficulty what is the problem everyone has different taste bud so this is foolish person because he is thinking he is like this false ego actually he is a doer he is not able to see it is the influence of the mode that i have a liking for a particular taste it is not i like it is the prominent mode forces a taste upon me so then there is foods in the modes purpose of food increase purpose is three purpose of food one is food is meant to increase the duration of life it's meant to increase duration of life number of breaths are the same but the life become in goodness life is literally slow slow breath passion ignorance breath is faster in that way increases duration of life the food can purify the mind in other words few food can contaminate the mind also purpose of food is to purify the mind goodness will 
you, if you eat food in goodness, your mind will become calm, peaceful. You won't find fault much. The food has that, you know, food is the only thing that actually goes inside. Literally. Then aid in bodily strength. Food can make you weak. Food can make you strong. That is the purpose of food. Food and goodness, Krishna says, they are juicy, fatty. Fatty refers to ghee, butter, milk. Um, they are fatty. Wholesome, pleasing to the heart. Means you feel very satisfied actually. Um, but people in mode of goodness would love it. People in mode of passion would Maybe run away from fruits. Not only fruits, anything in goodness. One time I was a Sagar Maharaj. And then I would not take ice creams. So I ate with him. Then when devotee asked, would you like some ice cream, Maharaj? Maharaj said, of course, why not? So Maharaj ate ice cream. Yeah, Shamananda, you won't take ice cream. I'm like, no, Maharaj, I'm good. And then he said, see, milk is mode of goodness. Sugar is mode of goodness. All it contains is milk, milk products and sugar. It's more of goodness. What do you think now? <laughs> Whatever you say, my you know what I take the ice cream. Um, wholesome. Wholesome, pleasing to the heart, fatty, juicy. The result is increase the duration of life, purifies, purify one's existence. Also gives strength, health, happiness, satisfaction, good health. Make you happy, satisfied, strength, physical strength, nourishment. Um, this is more of goodness. Then we know uh, vegetables, fruits, grains. Whatever Krishna eats is basically more of goodness. After he eats, when he once he sees it, becomes transcendental. Before it is offered, it's more of goodness. Um, food cooked in the temple, everything in mode of goodness. But then after whatever you eat, whatever we eat, everything is transcendental. Food in passion, too much bitter, um, too sour, too much salty, too hot. Hot means spicy. Um, too hot, pungent, dry and burning. Means very hot temperature wise, very spicy. Dry means, uh, yeah, dry. Pungent, this is all. And too salty means too much salt. Too much sour, too much bitter. I'm sure devotees know like vinegar is too. Vinegar, uh, lemon, raw. I mean, lemon is sour. But if somebody tell like, like full just lemon, good. But if you make like lemonade, good. Lemonade is mode of goodness. Anything in moderate amount, great. Um, it is said that uh, six kind of foodstuffs are offered. There is sour, there is bitter. Everything is offered to Krishna. Uh, but the overall taste is pleasing, wholesome, like that. Juicy. You know, anything extreme is passion. Distress. Refers to pain. This is Vishwan Chakravarti Thakur. He says, what is the result of food if one eats food in mode of passion? Distress refers to pain felt while eating such food. If you eat too dry, you feel like so difficult to engulf the food. So difficult to get it down the throat. So they refers to pain felt while eating such food. And when it is too bitter, too salty, too sour, too hot, too chilly, it's like, it's pain. Um, like I know people eat raw chili, they have tears in their eyes and they feel very good about it. So this is because the happiness is coming from passion. Um, but they are feeling that, they are feeling burning in their throat. But it is very distress experience. But they enjoy that experience. So this, So this is passion. Then there is misery, depression one feels after such eating, the stomach, the heart, everything is burning, feeling so uncomfortable, 
if you want to take some rest in a dinner you took like everything like vinegar anything sour bitter feel like very uncomfortable so misery depression one feels after such eating such food and distress while eating such food and disease results yet to be felt so vishnu chakravarti thakur says these are the three effects of eating food in mode of passion eating food in mode of goodness is like all glories to this food prepared over 3 hours prabhu pas is except prashadam tasteless you eat it and there is no taste it has decomposed smells are rotten like wine is rotten actually fruit juice when it rots and rots and develops all those you know fungi and all those you know rots and rots and rots and rots and rots and it become like a miserable experience to drink and it's decomposed basically and that is mode of ignorance putrid foul smelling remnants because remnants is mixed with the saliva prabhu says except the remnants of pure devotees and shri krishna which has the which is very very powerful for bhakti but remnants and untouchables food and mode of ignorance then that was food in three modes then there is sacrifice in three modes mode of goodness sacrifice according to direction of scriptures like for us yagya sacrifice sankirtan yagya prabhu says recommended for this age chanting the holy names of krishna hari krishna hari krishna 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 hari 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 ram hari ram 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 hari hari according to the direction of scripture this is what bhagavad gita says satatam kirti antama another sacrifice mentioned in bhagavad gita is to accept a spiritual master these are all sacrifices there are different sacrifices for different yogas so according to scriptures goodness then as a matter of duty why do you want to chant as a matter of duty today we were discussing just before this program we were discussing chanting should not be done based on moods i feel like so i will chant i don't feel like so i don't want to chant today on i mean for i am this bhakti shastri so everyone is already initiated here that's assumption or most of the what is initiated here um so obviously everyone is like <laughs> those are not any did like we dedicated to 16 rounds um but still mood swings may be there so mode of goodness is uh, um as a duty this is my service to krishna it doesn't matter how i feel my service to krishna i do it krishna can treat me in any way I, krishna likes asli seva padaratam pinashtum i'm not going to leave shelter of krishna in every situation i'm going to take shelter of krishna i'll beg for krishna's mercy i'll beg for guru's mercy i'll beg to prabhupad please help me in this situation one understands that whatever suffering i am going through is because of my past misdeeds because of the distress i have given to other living entities now distress is coming back to me i deserve much much more because my activities are so sinful and my activities are so uh so deeply inglorious um that punishment is like uncount uncountable but then prabhupada is very kind guru is very kind krishna is very kind i am getting on the aspect of it and i deserve much worse but in the state also it's lot of suffering but because mood swings so krishna i pray to you please help me in this situation i don't know what else to do krishna so doing it as a set doing the sacrifice as a matter of duty go to temple prabhupada says go to temple to offer respects to supreme personality of god as a matter of duty most of people go to temple not to pay respect but to want something from the lord especially demigod worshipers some material desires but we don't go to temple because we want something from them or we are doing this austerity my lord so you can give me this benediction 
for this austerity, this is what I want. For doing this, I want this. For doing this, I want this. No. I am a servant of Krishna. What is the role of servant? To pay respect to the master. I am going just to offer my respects to Krishna. We also want something. What we want is, Krishna, please keep me engaged in your service. Not only in this life, in every life, Krishna, please keep me engaged in your service. Service is a privilege. Having an opportunity to serve. It's like we have got this opportunity after millions of lifetimes. Now we don't want to lose it. Krishna, please engage me in your service. Whatever the service is, all services are great. Whether it is cooking for Krishna, whether it is washing pots for Krishna, whether it is cleaning for Krishna, whether it is dressing Krishna, whether it is spreading the holy names of Krishna, that whatever Krishna decides, my life anyways will happen according to Krishna's direction only. Um, Krishna is the one who runs our lives. Um, Krishna, please give me the privilege to be engaged in your service. This is something that we want. I don't want anything from you. Uh, Prabhupada says, go to temple to offer respect to Supreme Personality of God. Do sadhana bhakti based on scriptural injunctions, based on direction by Gurudev. Then sacrifice in goodness, desire no reward. Sacrifice means you do something. You take some inconvenience. You're sacrificing something. Generally. Um, like some people, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, fourth chapter is um, speaks a lot about sacrifice. Some sacrifice wealth, some sacrifice um, in the worship of demigods, some in impersonalist, some charity. That's also sacrifice for some. Um, different people have different modes of sacrifices. But for us, it is following instruction of Guru Maharaj, um, practicing nine forms of Navavidhi Bhakti. So general tendency is to perform sacrifice with a purpose in mind. But mode of goodness sacrifices, I don't want anything. It is based on scriptures. It is as a matter of duty. If it is uh, as a matter of love, it is Shuddha. Shuddha Sattva. There you practice sacrifice as a matter of love. But if you are doing it as a matter of duty, according to scriptures, without desiring anything, then it is goodness. Sacrifice in passion done for some material benefit for the sake of pride. As I mentioned, we can do now. Sacrifice in passion is also according to scriptures. But for some material benefit. When you start chanting, your life will become successful. Krishna will help you. You chant. Okay, chanting. Krishna, please help me. What do you want? Krishna, distress. Remove, reduce my distress. Krishna, then there is no, there is some, actually, removing removal of distress is also a kind of material benefit. My spiritual master says, Gajendra did not call out to Krishna to remove his distress. He approached Krishna out of distress. The example is given. But, my, but Radhanath Maharaj says he called out to Krishna just to offer a flower to Krishna. He did not say, Krishna, please save me. He just took shelter of Krishna. Ambarish Maharaj, he also did not ask for life. He just took shelter of Krishna. Pralad Maharaj also did not ask for life. He just took shelter of Krishna. This is actually great examples. Like I don't know if some of us can follow those examples. It's pure devotion actually. But generally, if it is out of matter of duty, goodness, without any rewards, but according to scripture, goodness, 
according to scripture, but with some desires which are material by nature. Passion. And then you do sacrifice for the sake of pride. Prabhu, I do only Nijal Ekadashi. It's a sacrifice. But then I want others to know. Passion. Uh, Prabhu, you know what? I chant 64 rounds every day. Really? Yeah. How many do you chant? 16. Okay. okay. You should chant more. See me? I chant 64 rounds. Passion. Why, why, why do you want to tell you chant 64 rounds? Because I want them to appreciate me that I chant 64 rounds. So this is according to scripture. But there is something I want from what I'm doing. Maybe some name and fame. Usually devotees are very much attached to name and fame because you know, nothing else they can get anyways. All sense gratification is blocked for devotees. No meat eating, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling. Anyway, devotees are not interested in those things anyways. Um, but wealth may be interested. Women, they may be interested. Not interested. Desires may be there. But usually people are very good uh, saying no to women. But saying no to wealth some are able to say no, some are not able to say no. But followers, this I want. What are followers to see, right? So this is again. Then material benefits with a material desire triggers envy. Whatever you want, anything you want, you become envious. Anything you want in this world, you'll become envious. Because somebody will have more than what you have in the area what you want. Immediate envy will come. Root cause of envy is material business. So sacrifice in passion, bhakti, according to scripture, for some material benefit. I want, I want. Some for the sake of pride. Actually, it is not easy to do bhakti because you know we can start bhakti, but even after starting bhakti, the modes doesn't leave us. Whatever we do is contaminated by our prominent mode. We are mode of ignorance. We cannot bhakti practice bhakti in passion. We will practice bhakti in ignorance. If we are in mode of passion, most of the people are in mode of passion. They cannot practice bhakti in goodness. They'll practice bhakti in passion only. If you are in mode of goodness, you will practice bhakti in goodness. You don't want name fame. You are doing it as a matter of duty. You don't want anything. Great. Ignorance, generally ignorance. There is bhakti in ignorance also. Kapila Dev, Kapila Muni describes that. Bhakti and ignorance, which is the separatist mentality, ulterior motives. But here, with Bhagavad Gita, in Bhagavad Gita, it is without scriptural injunction, without prasadam distribution. It may be with scriptural injunction, but after sacrifice, no prasadam distribution. It turns into ignorance. Or you do a puja, but no Vedic hymns are chanted. No remuneration or no, nothing is given to the priest. Priest came, performed the yajna, and priest left, and you don't give him anything. Then it turns into ignorance. Or you do it, but you don't have faith. Like I remember, we used to do some kind of puja in Diwali, but I was interested only in crackers. <laughs> So then later on the night, Bhagavad Gita said, Oh, come on, good. <laughs> come on, good. Uh, sacrifice. And you're sitting there where the consciousness is when it will be over. Oh, this is too long. Puja. I so long. Huh? Friends are waiting outside. So faith is missing. Um, but primarily without scriptural injunction, like politicians, they also do some kind of sacrifice, but turns into ignorance. Okay, worshipping demigods without scriptural injunction for sake of money to show religiosity turns into ignorance.
to show religiosity, say I am a devotee, for the sake of money, without scriptural injunction. Okay. But if you worship demigods according to scriptural injunctions, like with proper vidhi, uh, for material benefits, becomes passion. Without scriptural injunction, becomes ignorance. Then austerity of body, uh, worship, we use the body to worship the Supreme God, the Brahmanas, Guru, superiors like father and mother. Austerity of body, bow down. This austerity of body. Sachinan Mahara says, anyways, he says, anyways. But try to find an opportunity to bow down. Um, at least we bow down and we say Jai Vishnu Pad Parahaam Sapari Rajga Chari Jai Dhwani Jai Dhwani after the Aratis at least that time we bow down so you know at least sometime we should bow down this austerity of the body then uh, no austerity of body means it's okay I will repay respect in my mind Jai Lord Krishna Bhagavan Ki Jai and then but austerity of body please Bow down, worship them. Supreme Lord Brahmana, spiritual master, superior like father and mother. Cleanliness, austerity of body, keep it clean. People want to take shortcuts and don't keep the bodies clean. So, at least one bath a day, Prabhupada says, at least one bath a day. Um, austerity of body. Then simplicity, don't dress luxuriantly. Luxuriant dressing is actually passion for the sake of prestige and honor. But simplicity is uh, um, what is a body? Actually, it's you know, a, like you is a vehicle for suffering, actually. Material body is like a headache, actually. But at the same time, we need it to worship Krishna. But then we should use it to worship Krishna. <laughs> should not use it to worship ourselves. <laughs> uh, otherwise, it's not austerity of the body. Then there is celibacy. Back to celibacy. It is a sex life without... Not for the procreation of children, one loses the celibacy. On little stricter sense, it is also called as begging regulatory principle. Practicing bhakti in this world is not easy because many desires are there, but we should try our best. Then the last one is non violence. Don't commit violence onto the body or onto others' bodies like animals. Uh, today, one person came. I was speaking about no meat eating, no gambling, no intoxication, no illicit sex. One person came and he said, uh, but what about proteins? I said, Prabhu, uh, animal killing is violence. Um, there are many sources of proteins. We are non-violent people. He says, but we can kill animal without any violence. I was like, oh, I like, how can you kill animals without violence? He said, yeah, there is research on it. Nowadays, people kill animals uh, in such a way that it doesn't pain them. How is it possible to kill somebody without pain? He said, yeah, it's, it's, it's happening now. So there is no violence there. So I was like, too much ego, actually. Ego means like, you know, like too much ego. Is like, uh, <laughs> I was like shocked actually. <laughs> I said, no, do what you can. This is what scripture says. <laughs> That's it because no need of arguing. Um, and anyways, <clears throat> non-violence. Then austerity of speech, speaking truthful words. Process of speaking, process of speaking in spiritual circles is to quote scriptures, Prabhupada says. How do you speak in spiritual circles? Prabhupada said, whatever you speak, um, corroborate it with the Shastric references. Just re justify it. 
to scriptures. So speaking truthful words is an austerity of speech. Yeah, one should not, one should not. Um, oh, one second. Recently, somehow I'm speaking a lot on this because I was just very much surprised by Bhagavatam. Um, but one should not cheat. How does one cheat? By speaking pleasing words and hiding absolute truth. Always absolute truth over pleasing words. People want People want everyone to support their conception. But we should not support anybody's conception which is against the scriptures. Even if they feel bad. Tell the truth. If it is like, you know, relative truth, don't worry about it. But absolute truth, never compromise with that. Otherwise, uh, Krishna will not engage us in uh, especially preaching opportunities. If you water down, you will not be empowered. I have seen those who like great souls, they speak as it is. They don't care about how the person feels. But they speak with compassion. But they don't meddle with the truth. Like Prabhupada, straightforward. Devotee said, Prabhupada, please don't say regulatory principles. In the beginning, Prabhupada compromised. But then as soon as they were initiated, Prabhupada posted it, this is what you have to follow. Prabhupada straight. No sweet talkings. Prabhupada was like, what about this uh, uh, Maharshi Yogi? Yeah, he is bogus. What about this? This person, I will beat him with my boot. On, I'll kick him on his face with my boot. It's like shocking actually. Like straight, he is my body. He is just, you know, this is what they say. This is all bogus. This is all cheating. They are all cheating. Bhagavad Dharma is real. Straight. Don't leave scope for, yeah, it's okay. No, no, it's not okay. It is what it is. This is actually austerity of speech. Recently, I was sharing, I was reading, and I was inspired. So I was discussing with some devotees. Um, Yudhishthir Maharaj was disturbed because Dhritarashtra, Gandhari and Vidura left without informing. Yudhishthir Maharaj was thinking, you know, they were under my care and they left. He was feeling separation. He asked Sanjay, Sanjay, where is our master Dhritarashtra? This is after Mahabharat war when Dhritarashtra was living. And first he tried to kill Bhima because Bhima was the killed one who killed all the hundred sons of Dhritarash. But then Krishna plays a Katputla, a caricature. Um, but still, Yudhishthir Maharaj did not see any fault in Dhritarashtra. And Yudhishthir Maharaj was serving Dhritarashtra with love and affection. But he was very much because he felt like I have done something wrong. That's why Dhritarashtra has left. I think the trust has seen that I am a very ungrateful person. That's why the trust has left. Yudhishya Maharaj, we see, he is very eager to find fault in himself. This Mahabharat war happened because of me. So here Sanjay. Sanjay also knows the truth that this is Adharma. He tells in Bhagavad Gita. The trust is on the Dharma side. Dharma will win. <laughs> he tells. But then he has a lot of affection for his master, the trust. So they both are crying. Narad Muni comes. Narad Muni understand the situation. Narad Muni tells, he was feeling separation with Yudhishthir Maharaj. Narad Muni is telling to Yudhishthir Maharaj, feeling of separation is because of illusion only and nothing more. It was actually a shock for me. Because, you know, Narad Muni is straightforward. He is telling, out of false ego, one thinks one is a maintainer. When one is not the maintainer, it is a position of Krishna to be the maintainer. Dhritarashtra is like, Yudhishthir Maharaj is like, 
शुद्ध 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 भक्त एंड नारद मुनि you know i mean we we consider this a yoga maya potency he was just feeling separation and narad muni very strict very clear no cheating prabhu says you know, guru means heavy means just just repeat the shastra if he says vishnu maharaj don't worry i'm very sorry prabhupad also no prabhupad this story is there of uh, peter bandwash peter bandwash he recently left the body when his money was taken he gave a donation to become a life member and the person who took the money he ran away so peter went to meet prabhupad he said your society is so many, full of so many pure souls and then um, it's a spiritual organization everything is so nice here and then your own people they see the money and they run away what kind of society is this so prabhupada was not apologetic prabhupada said don't blame the instrument of your own karma it hit him peter he never forget that line for the rest of his life he said if prabhupada would have said i'm sorry this is not good then he would have forgotten but prabhupada was not prabhupada said, no, don't prabhupada told him truth many times truth is not something that we want to hear but speaking truth to what is an austerity of speech then speaking the words which are pleasing um truthful words over pleasing ganesh is bhagwan no krishna is bhagwan ganesh accepted krishna is bhagwan and then he wrote shivan bhagavatam the condition was he will write only what he accepts beneficial it should be beneficial to them if the words are scriptural it will be beneficial don't compromise they may not like it today they will see the value tomorrow don't compromise don't try to be a nice person try to be helpful because you cannot help somebody if you are just too nice i mean we should be very nice but not at the cost of compromising the truth otherwise we will not help them will just be nice so it should be beneficial not agitating to others again this is for related truth should not agitate to others related truth means the truth that changes over time yeah you know prabhu you are a very envious person no need it changes over time if the prabhu is practicing bhakti and we will go anger will go everything will go so don't emphasize on like finding fault in others telling their faults no need but no compromise on scriptures though so not agitating to others prophecies teacher can correct only his student even if it is agitating but not others who are not his student prophecy this is very important you know don't be like in the name of speaking truth don't give free advices to anyone and everyone unless someone gives you the role to hear something from you like there is a saying no free advice even if it is truthful this is very important for open mentions but if somebody if you have a role to say then state forward that will help them also regularly reciting vedic literatures one should study the limitless stock of vedic literatures available prabhu says you know um prabhu said limitless stock of vedic literatures are available how many books i am hoping everyone is systematically reading shrimad bhagavatam then we have chaitanya charitamrita we have many other prabhupad books right now we are doing bhagavad gita we have exams for that there is thorough reading that is required preparation is required this is austerity of speech okay so there is related truth prefer 
pleasing words over relative truth. Prefer absolute truth over pleasing words. Not agitating to others. To if somebody gives you a role to speak, speak the truth. Otherwise, don't give free advices. Then austerity of mind. Prabhupada says gravity of thought. Best training for mind. Um, gravity is one austerity. Means not to deviate from Krishna consciousness. Always avoid sense gratification. So what is gravity means? This is one of the austerity of mind. Keep the mind grave. Prabhupada says keeping the mind grave is the best training for the mind. And how do we train the mind? I mean, I'm sure everyone here wants to train their minds. I also want to train my mind. So not to deviate the mind from Krishna consciousness. Then you are grave. Grave means hold the mind and keep it centered around Krishna. Prabhupada formula, look the seat of Krishna. But whatever works for you. Because it takes a lot of advancement to be able to always might it on the spirit of Krishna. But that is a sure, sure solution. But somehow or other keep the mind. For us, it's a training process. It's best training for mind is not to deviate the mind from Krishna consciousness. What happens as soon as the mind always avoids sense gratification? Why? The moment there is a scope, there is an opportunity for sense gratification, mind will become absorbed easily. For mind to remember Krishna is an austerity. For mind to meditate, contemplate, sense gratification, it's spontaneous. But for mind to remember Krishna is like, it's a training. Prabhupada said, this is called grave. grave. This is an austerity. What is an austerity for mind? Avoid contemplation or sense gratification, center around Krishna. Best training for mind. Then satisfaction, purpose is obtained by taking mind away from sense gratification. Stories, satisfying stories from Puranas. Prabhupada says, keep the mind satisfied. How the mind becomes unsatisfied? The moment mind goes towards sense gratification, mind will become unsatisfied. Why? Because spontaneously we have a desire to enjoy. Spontaneously. So if you want to keep the mind satisfied, keep the opportunities for sense gratification away. Keep it centered around Krishna. Mind will be peaceful and satisfied. And Prabhupada says... Uh, uh, one way to satisfy the mind, sat satisfying stories from Puranas. From Purana, we mean Bhagavad Purana. Prabhupada says Mahabharata also. Vedic scriptures. Vedic scriptures means books written in our line, in our disciplic succession, in our parampara. That will satisfy the mind. Keep engaged, keep the mind engaged. Krishna conscious way. Out of sense gratification will dissatisfy the mind. Then there is simplicity. Simplicity means no duplicity. Always think of others' welfare. Very important, actually. The mind is spontaneously attracted to fault finding. I mean, I'm sure many devotees are gradually coming out of it. Um, but the mind has this. Uh, Especially when we are like not doing good, a lot of chanting is not good, a lot of fault finding will come. When chanting is good, you feel everybody is a great soul. I must bow down to everyone. But when chanting is not good, then because of him, he's like this, he's like that. This all is happening to me only. This is all ill effects of chanting. So, what is the austerity of mind? Keep it simple. Duplicity means outside you act in one way, inside you think in another way. Duplicity. Outside you glorify, inside you criticize. Duplicity. Keep the mind simple. Simple means what's inside, but that's inside, outside, same. 
So Prabhupada says, how do we do that? Always think of others welfare. If somebody is giving you a lot of trouble, don't mentally curse them also. What should we do? One is my own karma. That is one way. Nonetheless, whatever anybody does to us, my Lord, whoever is giving me suffering, let them be happy. Let no suffering come upon them. This is taught by many examples. Haridas Thakur was being beaten up and he said, my Lord, please forgive them. Thinking of others' welfare even materially. Jesus Christ being crucified, my Lord, please forgive them. Any suffering caused upon us, if we are still others' welfare, now your mind is called simple. It is that simplicity is required to attain Krishna's mercy. Not the simplicity of the body. Simplicity of body is easy. Um, devotees usually, they are simply dressed most of the time. Uh, simplicity of mind, no duplicity. Crooked mind, how will Krishna come there? But if the mind is thinking of others' welfare, great. So no duplicity. If this is, these are all from Prabhupada purport on what does it mean? Self-control implies detachment from sense gratification. Self-control. Mind wants it to control the mind. Some places it's okay to lose control. Like prashadam. Prabhupada says, eat to your neck. But anything which is not like, I think prashadam is the only way, place where we can, it's okay to not control it. But great devotees, they control that also. But it's okay. It's not taking us away from bhakti at least. But we will become, we will sleep more. We will be a little more lazy. The effects will be there. For sure. Um, but otherwise, control the mind. Self-control is an austerity of mind. And then last is purification of one's existence. How do we purify one's existence? By straightforward dealings. Okay, then we discussed about austerity of body, austerity of speech, austerity of mind. Very important topics. Now, austerity in goodness with transcendental faith, not expecting material benefits for the sake of pleasing supreme. So what is austerity in goodness? Austerity in goodness can be austerity of body in goodness, austerity of speech in goodness, austerity of mind in goodness. Austerity of body in passion, austerity of speech in passion, austerity of mind in passion. So austerity can be in three modes. Austerity in goodness, austerity in passion, austerity in ignorance. Austerity itself are of three types. Austerity of body, austerity of mind, austerity of speech. All three of them in goodness is with transcendental faith. Not expecting material benefit for the sake of supreme, uh, pleasing supreme. Everything is quite the same. Um, it is out of pride for the sake of respect, honor and worship. Um, not stable, neither stable nor permanent. Um, if you do something like say austerity, I'm thinking what example do we take? Um, let's take austerity of uh, body. Let's say worship, father and mother, superiors. Um, I don't know if we can do that for honor and worship, but it is it is not stable, not not permanent. Even if you get honor, the nature of this word is duality. Duality means today somebody is honoring you, tomorrow same will criticize you. Today somebody is telling, oh, my life changed because of you. Tomorrow they will say, my life is miserable because of you. My life is blissful because of you. Tomorrow my life is miserable because of you. This is the nature of this world.
So Krishna says it is neither stable nor permanent. Desiring that is simply going to frustrate us. But if you do it as a matter of duty, you are good. If you become attached, then the joy you derive from the service, the misery is coming tomorrow waiting for you. So for the sake of respect, honor, worship, out of pride, out of pride, why it says out of pride? Because if I'm expecting honor and worship, then that means I'm great soul. That's why I should be worshipped right. I must be great. So I deserve to be respected and honored and worshipped. So pride gave rise to this desire. Pride itself is mode of passion. They're all concomitant factors. They exist together. Krishna says neither, but this is, now you are doing austerity, but this is what you want from your austerity. It is neither stable nor permanent. Why you want self-control? Because I'm great in self-control. I'm better than others. Now I need to be respected for that. But it is neither stable nor permanent. Anything you see, gravity, why you want to, to always think of Krishna, I want others to know because first thing, I'm a great soul. Why? Because I'm always thinking of Krishna. It's an austerity of mind. But why do you want to do that? I want others to know, see my mind. I'm constantly focusing on Krishna. Neither stable nor... The moment we become pride, anyways, we lose what we have. Nature of pride is Krishna hates pride. Anybody becomes proud, obviously, it's not going to be stable and permanent. So this is mode of passion. I mean, it's not easy because the thing is, the modes, modes control us actually. We are controlled by the modes. This is called, we are under Maya's influence. Everything we do is covered by three modes. We know the famous Famous line, devotee said, Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I'm trying to be Krishna conscious, but Maya captured purposes. You are in, you are always captured by Maya. Sometimes you become free and you think of Krishna without modes. Very, very difficult actually. And then austerity and ignorance out of foolishness with self torture to injure others like Hiranyakashipu, he would control his body, he would control his mind. You required, he, he was. Practicing self-control. He was practicing um, like his for him gravity was um, focus on the austerity of remembering Brahma. Train the mind to always meditate on the mantra to Om Brahma Devaya Namaha Om Brahma Devaya Namaha So you know he was doing not that he was following all the aspects but he was doing some austerity of mind, some austerity of body. Obviously, standing on one leg, there's an austerity of body for the sake of pleasing Brahma, whatever. But then, what was his motive? Um, one is self-torture. He wanted to injure others. That's what he did when he got the powers. He gave very hard time to devatas and everybody else. Out of foolishness, why would you want from this? From this power, I want to kill Vishnu. Usse bada bevkuf kon hoga? You want to kill Vishnu. So this is austerity is there, but in ignorance. All right. Then second last charity. Charity in mode of goodness will go fast. Out of duty without expectation of return. You do it because, um, you know, it's the duty of a grihastha to do charity. Duty of a brahmachari and renounced order to give knowledge. Duty of vana prastha to perform austerities. Duty of Brahmachari especially render service. Sannyasis uh, give knowledge. Mm. Charity and goodness out of duty without expectation of it. Mm -hmm. Then there is a proper time and place at pilgrimage places. Charity given at a proper time and place. Like Prabhupada says, like, you go to pilgrimage places, you give some charity there. To the temples, it's charity and goodness or transcendental. 
there is proper time and place. To a worthy person, spiritual perfection is a consideration because you want to make sure the person you are giving the money, he will use it in Krishna's service. He is not going to use it in sense gratification. Sense gratification. If devotee uses sense gratification, still okay. Because their body is used in Krishna's service. So they use the charity to say, uh, whatever, what does devotee want? Buy some clothes for themselves. Anything. Perfect. Then charity and passion, expectation of some return, honor, elevation to heaven. So what is charity and passion? Give me a second. What is charity and passion? Um, I want everyone to know what I did, how much I gave. I will be elevated to heavenly kingdom because I give so much charity. I will be saved in future because of charity I made. No, no, kami. Um, no scarcity will be for me in the future. Charity and passion. Then grudging mood with great trouble and repentance afterwards. So uh, like great trouble. Probably thoda donation, donation, kya donation upload. So it's very painful to give donation. And after giving the donation, one feels like what did I do? Now see, I have this much less. So grudging mood. Like there is some anger that I had to give. Then sometimes given under obligation at the request of superior purposes. Then grudging mood may come. That becomes charity and passion. Charity and ignorance at an improper place, improper time, unworthy person for indulgence in intoxication. We know this. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure everyone understands. Charity of wine, charity of those kind of things. Without proper attention and respect. Uh, you give charity, but then you don't give respect. Yeah, take it. So it's like, you know, there is anger. That's why there is no proper attention, proper respect. Then we are giving charity, but it, there is a tinge of mode of ignorance there. Then the last one, conclusion, Om Tat Sat. Although all activities are contaminated by modes, naturally see our austerity, our body, mind and speech in modes, our charity is in modes, our food is in modes, our sacrifice is in modes. The thing is, when we are in mode of passion, everything will be in mode of passion only. The sacrifice will be, we will do, we want material benefits. Charity we do, we want material benefits. Austerities we do, we want material benefits. Passion is very prominent actually, not easy to come to goodness. So whatever mode we are in, everything will be tainted by that mode. So although all activities are contaminated by the mode, Krishna says, they can be made as the means of spiritual elevation by aiming them at the, at the supreme Om Tat Sat. Om Tat Sat means, yes, everything is contaminated by the lower modes. Om Tat Sat means I am doing it for the pleasure of Krishna. So you do it, Om Tat Sat. All activities are contaminated by modes. I am sure um, if we are honest, we know how much we are contaminated by the modes. They can be made as a means of spiritual elevation by aiming them at the Supreme. By the words Om Tat Sat. We will see the meaning of these words also. From beginning of creation, the three words Om Tat Sat were used to indicate the Supreme Absolute Truth. Om Tat Sat means, O oh Lord, it is for you. Brahma performs sacrifices by indicating Supreme Lords with these three words. Whenever Brahma tries to, you know, he 
performs many yagyas to please Vishnu. Whatever he does, Om Tat Sat for the place. Many sannyasis also nowadays they use this three words Om Tat Sat. Some people, there was one person I met, he said, we should not chant Hare Krishna Mahamantra, not a devotee, obviously. No devotee will say that. He said, we should not chant oh, oh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. We should chant Om Tat Sat because that is the only mantra Krishna spe speaks in Bhagavad Gita. Bogus actually. Krishna never says to chant this mantra on beeps. Krishna says, whatever you do, Offer it to the Supreme through this words Om Tat Sat. Mantra is Hare Krishna Mahamantra only for purification. Satatam Kirti Antamam is always glorifying Krishna. Hare Krishna Mahamantra is glorifying Krishna. Om Tat Sat is like you do some charity, you end with saying Om Tat Sat. You do some austerity, Ekadashi fasting, Om Tat Sat. It's like it's a Kriya. Which is of the offering the results to the Lord. Oh my Lord, this is for you, Om Tat Sat. Brahma performs sacrifice by indicating Supreme Lord with these three words. Then, according to Bhagavad Gita, any work should be done for Om Tat Sat, for the Supreme Personality of God. So, Kriya offering to Lord is used with the words Om Tat Sat. That is acting in Krishna consciousness means for the for pleasing. For the Supreme Personality of God. It is done for Om Tat Sat. Om means Vishnu. Uh, Krishna also says in Bhagavad Gita. Now the meanings of these three words. What does Om, what does Tat, what does Sat means. Om means Vishnu. This is placed at the beginning of the Vedic hymns. To indicate Supreme Goal. And thus attain the Supreme. Uh, Krishna also says I am Om. So Om is Vishnu. In yoga, those who do yoga retreats, they have you know pranayam. Then they have some brahmari where they close their nose and eyes and they say Om. It's like it's actually Om is an impersonal representation, impersonal sound vibration of Vishnu or Krishna. So Om means Vishnu. And this from Rig Veda, Om Tad Vishnu Yat Paramam Padakam Sada Pasayanti Surayaha <clears throat> which we usually recite this mantra. Um, Dibiva Chakshura Tatam Tad Vipraso Vipanyavo Jagrabam Sasa Samendite Vishnu Yat Paramam Padakam Om Shri Vishnu Shri Vishnu Shri Vishnu Mm. From Rig Veda basically means Om Om Tad Vishnu means Om Vishnu you are also Om Tad Vishnu Paramam Padagam. Um, I am now taking my step into the abode of Vishnu, which is Vaikuntha. This we usually chant this mantra as per uh, uh, our uh, deity ministry. We should chant this mantra from Rig Veda after doing Achman. If you do a half achman, Om Keshavaya Namaha, Narayana Madhavaya Namaha, Govindaya Vishnu Namaha, Om Tal Vishnu Yat Paragam Paragam, then the achman is complete. Um, so Om means Vishnu. Tat describes detachment. Tat means that work for the sake of liberation. These activities are done with disregard for, are done with disregard for fruit and business. I don't want anything. I'm doing it for you. Om Tat. These activities without anything written, I am doing for Om. Om Tat. It's like Kriya offered to Vishnu. For us, doing it for the sake of pleasing Krishna. That describes detachment for the sake of liberation. These activities are done with disregard for fruitive results. Sat. Helps to dedicate activity for the pleasure of the Lord and his devotees. The performers for sex. The performer. Yeah, Prabhu, I'll take your question in a minute, Prabhu. I see your hand raised. Just the second last slide, then I'll take question. The performer of a sacrifice is called Sat. Uh, 
So what the Sat means, I am dedicating it to Krishna. So Om Tat Sat means dedicating this activity for the pleasure of Krishna. Sat means dedicating to whom Om, Krishna, what, Tat, these detached activities. It's important to understand the meaning of what we mean. Om Tat Sat basically means, my Lord, this is offered to you. Sat is Tat, I am dedicating, means Sat for Vishnu or Om. Om Tat Sat for you. So, uh, Krishna understands we are all in three modes. We will not be able to practice Shuddha Sattva with the austerity of charity, sacrifice, um, and food, um, what else, whatever we discussed. So use these three words. And then by using these three words with every austerity, with every act of uh, charity, austerity, or yagya, sacrifice, or food, uh, you are using it for the sake of, you are using it for spiritual development. Om Tat Sat is used when initiating a person or offering sacred thread and many other yagyas. When we initiate, I mean, basically our Guru Devs, in Iskon, when I, I mean when we initiate in Iskon, mm, the different spiritual master, they specifically use the word Om Tat Sat. I am doing this for the pleasure of Krishna. You offer a sacred thread, Om Tat Sat. So Prabhupada said this is used. Prabhupada also will use these words, Om Tat Sat. Many devotees after giving a lecture, they said Om Tat Sat means I am dedicating this service of speaking for the pleasure of Krishna. So this is a conclusion, Om Tat Sat. After hearing which activities are sat, one naturally wishes to know which activities are sat. Krishna responds to this query in the final verse of this chapter. So he said, sat means activities which are for the which are dedicated to please Guru, Krishna, and Vaishnavas. What is asat? Anything done as sacrifice, charity, or penance without faith in the Supreme or Son of Pritha is impermanent. Do some charity do some sacrifice, do some austerity, um, but you are doing it without faith, then the benefits is impermanent. Basically, if you're not doing it for Krishna, impermanent benefit. Why? You give some charity. Instead of spiritual progress, you get money back. But then that will be spent and then finish. So the results are impermanent. Results will be there. Benefit will be there. These are great activities, but you are using it only for temporary gain. So anything not done, done without faith in Krishna is impermanent. Do, do some austerity, you will get the good karma of performing that austerity, bowing down, worshipping. But if you are doing it without faith, it becomes good karma. You get some benefit and the, it's neutralized. It is called asat and is useless both in this life and the next. Why it's useless? Because it is not conducive to spiritual development. So, then it's useless. It is useless because this is a temporary ultimate goal of all Vedic instruction is to understand Krishna. So, that's all we have with this. Come to the end of 17th chapter. Um, let's see if there are any discussions. Prabhu uh, Dhanakrishna. Jai Shila Prabhupada. Uh, uh, Prabhuji, uh, uh, one, uh, one question regarding the Achman, Prabhuji. You said like, generally we, when we do Achman, we say Om Keshvai Nama, Om Narayanai Nama, Om Madhvai Nama, and Om, Om Govindai Nama. After that, we have to say Om Tasat? No, after that, we say Om Tad Vishnu Yer Param Om Param Sada Pasyanti. So this mantra from Rig Veda Prabhuji. Because uh, Achman means we are purifying ourselves. Before Achman, I mean after Achman, we approach the Supreme Lord Prabhuji. Like either offering or dressing or arati. Before we kind of deal with the Lord, 
we do achman we purify ourselves or even doing yagya first we do achman before we approach krishna we do achman after achman we chant this mantra which basically means now i am entering into vaikuntha where there is where there is no influence of material energy now the supreme personality of god head i am going to face supreme personality of god head i to i to render service to him so this prepares the consciousness so after achman this mantra then we enter all to uh prabhuji sorry can you repeat again which mantra sorry i got confused sorry audio was little it's, off at my side it's from rigved prabhu you can search uh, om tad vishnu yat paramam padagam it's actually say p a d a m but it's pronounced as padagam om tad vishnu paramam padam and you will find it prabhu okay prabhu ji okay thank you pungent is like vinegar is pungent i saw any other question anyone has hari krishna prabhu ji dhanyawad pranam jai shri ram prabhu ji very prabhu ji very uh, humbling session prabhu ji thank you very much uh, uh my inquiry is we hear that bhakti uh, helps one to come out of the modes like uh, because it 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 creates goodness without any mixture of other lower modes like it's so potent if it is done nicely under guidance of spiritual master so but at the same time we hear that one who is in uh, sometimes bhakti increases pride like that way it increases the lower modes that way so one who is in mode of passion and he is i mean uh, uh, and he is doing bhakti so his passion will increase that way but how would it come out one who is in mode of passion and he is so that way so i was thinking prabhu ji bhakti is potent so is it like one has to find those times of the days when a particular like goodness is prominent and then perform bhakti even though his nature is passion but he has to find out some regulation so and then perform bhakti so that bhakti doesn't increase his inherent passion mood and brings more goodness so i was really confused on that aspect mm, thank you prabhu prabhu see we may chant in the morning but we are performing bhakti kind of we are trying to perform bhakti the whole day right to our services to our readings to more chantings so in a way for us i mean for us bhakti is not limited to a particular time right prabhu ji it's like whole day i mean naturally we are distracted but then we try to bring back and keep it krishna centered so how do we deal with this situation two things happen prabhu one is attentive bhakti attentive bhakti is chaitanya mahaprabhu says one should be careful chaitanya mahaprabhu says when we water the roots of the tree the weeds will grow and one should be very careful not to water the weeds watering the weeds means we start desiring them not watering the weeds means condemning ourselves and then trying to make it pure this is called attentive bhakti inattentive bhakti means feeding the weeds and enjoying the weeds but then it seems like bhakti is growing but only ego and pride is growing and they are actually choking the real bhakti so that's why mahaprabhu says one should be very careful prabhu says attentive devotional service prabhu says attentive devotional service another thing prabhu um krishna helps when pride comes whatever we are proud of krishna will humble us there and we will simply stand with our head bowed down praying to krishna krishna is serving us without krishna's help we cannot practice bhakti without weeks because like you know we are deeply ingrained prabhu um unless krishna helps krishna helps through guru 
Krishna helps by humbling us through different circumstances. Krishna helps through Shastra like Chaitanya Charita Amrita and the instruction of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So these are all our kind of fences, Prabhu. Through the fences, we protect. We protect our birthday. Is that all right, Prabhuji? Yes, probably this is helpful, uh, like being mindful, attentiveness while performing and uh, depending upon mercy, like Krishna helps that person. Yes, Prabhuji. Thank you. Krishna humbles us, Prabhu. We all have experiences. Pride, the moment pride comes, a devotee knows, oh no, why this thought came? Now it will be a disastrous experience. After that, Disaster will come. The internal reason for our little fall down is pride. External reason is we may say something to somebody. It's all circumstances Krishna puts us in. So we can again take a humble position. Krishna will again and again give us a humble position. This is Krishna's love. All right. Thank you, Prabhu. Anything else anyone has? Yes, Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Prabhu. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, my friend. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay, then I will ask. <laughs> Sorry. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Uh, thank you for the nice class. Could you please maybe elaborate just a little bit on what do we mean by no free advice? Mother, I could not understand your question. Once again, yes. could I elaborate yes. on? No free advice. You said like, you know, mm -hmm. no, don't give any free advice. Because sometimes mm -hmm. with, with me, sometimes it does tend to happen unknowingly, unknowingly. If I see something which is against the bhakti principle or something, I might just say something to my family members or something. Hey, you know, try to avoid this or that. So does that also come under no free advice? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It depends upon how the other person takes it. Um, if they're feeling offended, um, something makes me to change. Like Prabhupada says, I mean, this is a very sensitive matter. One thing Prabhupada says, for a teacher to correct the student is okay, but for a teacher to correct another student is not permitted. Which basically says like, for example, I mean, with family member, it's a little bit gray area because we ha we want to train them for a good environment. At the same time, we want the other family members to be conducive. One instruction Prabhupada gave is, uh, if it is too much rules and regulations, then they may not be favorable also because they think, oh, this is too much, I don't want to practice this. Prabhupada also said that, please don't represent Krishna consciousness as a matter of rules and regulations. Our goal is, to make our own behavior and to make everything in such a way that the other people are inspired to take a bhakti. And that may require a little bit of tolerance. That may require a little bit of compromise. But the overall goal is others are taking up Krishna consciousness. Others becoming more favorable to Krishna consciousness. If by our behavior they are going away from Krishna, then may not be. That's why it said their tolerance plays a role there. Um, initially, especially, we may try to change and then we see it's not happening. And it's good to tolerate. But when it comes to temple environment, somebody is doing something. Maybe some devotee senior than us. No advice. Because it becomes an offense to instruct somebody who is superior to us. So we don't give advice. We rather always remain in a humble position. It's a Vaishnava etiquette. It's, it does not mean, I'm not saying that necessarily somebody who is practicing for a longer time is more advanced than others. It's not necessarily mean that. But then still we follow Vaishnava etiquettes. They make the Vaishnava beautiful. They make the Vaishnava attractive. And when etiquettes are proper, then we get blessings. But when we bridge the etiquettes, 
then devotees will be displeased with us and uh, uh, because the purpose of etiquette is pleasing to others. Then if they are taking guidance from somebody else, they are making a mistake. Then the choice is if you have the responsibility of that service, service is not happening nice. Then we can reach out to the authority of those devotees instead of directly if we don't have that privilege or the friendship with which we can instruct them. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you so much for the clarification. Thank you, much, Hare Krishna. Atul Nimai Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So my question is, I mean, uh, the previous question about the Archman. So generally, Archman, I, mean, I used to do that four things. I mean, Om Keshwai Namah, Om Madhavai Namah. But after that, the last sloka, right? So... I never spoken and even though I didn't know till now, till today. So is that a mistake I was doing or? I mean, I think there is no hard and fast rules because I'm sure if you go to different, like in our ISKCON, we follow that. But I'm sure if you go to some other Sampradaya, like even in uh, Gaudiya Sampradaya, like Saraswati Thakur's line, the way they offer food and the way, the way we offer food is different. So there are many differences. But the thing is, this is a standard in ISCO. So I would not necessarily call that it's a mistake. But I will say that it's good to, whenever we come to know, it's good to remember and uphold the same standard that is followed worldwide. And whenever you go to Radha Gopi Janala Mandir, there is an Achman sheet. Below the Achman sheet, this mantra is there, Prabhu. So devotees can see. I mean, especially the worshiping Radha Gopi Janavallava, then full Achman is required. And then there is this mantra, Prabhu. So what devotees do is like they are very quick. So they do the Achman, then they start making preparation, Arti plate, and they start chanting. Om Tad Vishnu, Yadparam, it goes in the mind. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Anyone has? Okay. Prabhuji's mother is done with my now. Thank you for tolerating me. Please forgive my offenses also. Vanchakalpa Taru Bhesha Kripa Sindhu Evacha. Patita nam pavane pio vaishna ve pio namo namaha. Another body vaishna vinda ki ye shila prabhupad ki cha. Thank you very much. Then the pranam, Sari Krishna. Sari Krishna Prabhuji, then the pranam Prabhuji. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Sari Krishna. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Then the pranam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prabhuji. Then the pranam. Sari Krishna.